Good morning. Uh, my topic for today is post-operative pain relief following major hepatobiliary surgery in cirrhotic patients. Pain is the most important and common complaint in the post-operative period following surgery. The patient remembers pain most often after surgery and if pain is not treated correctly at the time, it can even lead to development of chronic pain leading to more morbidities. Pain causes delay in return to normal function. It causes delay in recovery, delay in discharge of the patient. Hence, treatment of pain appropriately in the post-operative period is the most important thing after surgery. Now, I'll discuss my topic in these headings. Cirrhotic patients often require surgery for gallstone diseases, biliary diseases, small bowel colorectal diseases, abdominal wall hernias, pancreatic diseases for which procedures like Whipple's are done, and liver procedures per se, such as resections and transplantations. So, there are certain complications which arise from the analgesia we use in these patients because of the underlying pathology of cirrhosis. The analgesia which we use can induce hepatic encephalopathy, HRS in this uh, patients, gastrointestinal bleeding, which can result in substantial morbidity and even death. Hence, analgesia and appropriate analgesia is important in these patients to ensure a faster recovery. Studies have found that 30-day mortality rates after surgery in cirrhotic patients were around 10% in CTPA, 30% in CTPB, and 70 to 80% in CTPC. These figures have not significantly changed over time, even with recent advancements in surgical techniques with minimal invasive surgery. Hence, analgesia is very important in these patients. To, uh, analgesia is important to facilitate early mobilization and reduce post-operative complications. Now, to understand analgesia, first we have to understand the pain pathways. This pathway is important to understand where our analgesics act and which analgesics to use when. So pain pathway is transmitted from peripheral and visceral receptors. Visceral receptors is from visceral organs that is mainly transmitted by sympathetic fibers. The peripheral pain becomes important during surgeries because the peripheral pain is transmitted during incisions, during uh, incision for the surgery, retractions, and this is the main pathway of pain during surgery. The pain is transmitted from the A delta and C fibers. These are the first order neurons which they relay in the dorsal ganglia of the spinal cord. From here, the second order neurons start in the rexid laminae 1, 2, and 5 of the spinal cord, delay to the opposite side of the spinal cord, and ascend in the spinothalamic tract. Here, they synapse in the thalamus. From the thalamus, the third order neurons go and into the somatosensory cortex. So this is the pain pathway, and to act to stop pain, we can uh, use various analgesics which acts on various levels of these pathways to stop the transmission of pain. I'll be telling you about the different drugs which act on different pathways of the pain. Now, how are the mediators of pain? How, how is pain generated? In the peripheral nerves, pain generation starts when there's an action potential. Action potential starts when there are certain noxious stimuli. Noxious stimuli happen when there is inflammation in the peripheral uh, pathway. Pe inflammation happens because of surgery when there are incisions. This incision and uh, the traction lead to infl uh, generation of inflammatory mediators like bradykinins, cytokinins, histamines. All these mediators uh, release further neural mediators. All these mediators lead to generation of an action potential, and the action potential is propagated into the nerve onto the spinal cord, leading to pain. Now, coming to different dermatomes during surgery. Surgery, hap normally hepatobiliary surgery or abdominal surgery happens in these dermatomes. So it is important to know the dermatomes which transmit pain so that we can stop pain accordingly. The dermatomes in the abdomen are from T6, which is at the ziphy sternum, and L1, which is at the pubic symphysis. So any surgery in this vicinity, we can know which dermatomes to aim for and to stop pain. Normally, surgery at the stomach, the spinal nerve roots involved are T5 to T9. Similarly, at the duodenum, the nerve roots are T5 to T8. At the liver and gallbladder, T6 to T9. So any nerve blocks which we give, we have to target these specific nerve roots to stop transmission of pain. 
Now the coming to the types of surgeries in hepatobiliary surgery. First, there is a transverse a midline laparotomy incision, which happens when there is a laparotomy for major abdo surgical procedures like abdominal emergency surgery when there is a perforation. Then there is a transverse upper abdominal incision for major upper abdominal surgery involving the stomach, liver and pancreas. A subcostal incision, this is commonly used here for uh, cholecy open cholecystectomies, hepatic or jejunostomy and partial liver resection. The McBurney's incision is used for appendicectomies. Similarly, we can know the dermatome which is involved from the incision. Normally, a subcostal incision will involve pain in T5 to T9 dermatomes. A midline incision is a long incision and pain generally persists from T6 to T12 dermatomes. So all nerves have to be blocked to provide pain relief. Now coming to the modalities of the pain relief. Pain relief starts right from preoperative period, continues into the intraoperative and is most important in the postoperative period. Pain can be relieved either by medications or by regional nerve blocks which block the transmission of pain. The medications can be divided into NSAIDs, acetaminophen, opioids, neuropathic agent and a combination of these. And the regional blocks include epidural analgesia, intrathecal analgesia, regional field blocks and wound catheters. Now as I was telling you there are different uh, drugs which act on different pathways. The NSAIDs act are COX inhibitors. COX is the uh, pathway for generation of prostaglandins. So NSAIDs inhibit generation of prostaglandins which prevent noxious stimuli to enter the primary efferent neuron. Then the opioid, opioid are the most commonly used analgesics, opioid act on the opioid receptors in the brain and in the spinal cord, they are also present in the periphery. The local anesthetics again act in the periphery to prevent generation of a, a nerve impulse, to prevent transmission of the nerve impulses. And uh, neuropathic agents like gabapentin, neostigmine act at the central nervous system at the brain to pre decrease perception of pain. Acetaminophen or paracetamol is a COX-3 type of inhibitor that acts centrally as well as periphery to prevent pain. Now coming to individual drugs, the drug metabolism in a cirrhotic patient is uh, quite affected because normally drug um, undergoes metabolism in the liver in the three pathways. That is first is oxidation, reduction or hydrolysis reaction. This is the first stage. After either of these reactions, it undergoes conjugation via glucuronic acid or sulfate or acetate. After it is conjugated, it undergoes biliary excretion and elimination. So in liver disease, many of these pathways are affected and which affect our drug dosing and uh, regimen of our analgesic drugs. Plus, liver disease also causes uh, renal injury. So patients require adjustment because of the liver injury as well as the renal injury. Coming to the first class of drugs, the NSAIDs, this inhibits the activity of uh, cyclooxygenase 1 and COX-2 that prevents formation of prostaglandins and leukotrienes that prevents the propagation of impulses. These are normally metabolized by CYP450 enzymes in the liver. In cirrhotics, there is reduced ability to metabolize drugs and there is also impaired ability to synthesize albumin. So the NSAIDs normally bind to albumin. When there is decreased albumin, these NSAIDs are increased, uh, NSAIDs bioavailability is increased and this puts the patient at increased risk of complications. Now complications of NSAIDs if used in cirrhotics are mucosal bleeding, variceal hemorrhage, they impair the renal function, decrease the GFR, cramp precipitate HRS, development of diuretic resistant ascites and it, it itself has hepatotoxicity. Normally it is recommended as NSAIDs and aspirin should be avoided in patients with advanced CLD or cirrhosis. If used, selective COX-2 inhibitors like Celecoxib can be used with also a dose reduction. So generally these drugs are not used uh, postoperatively in liver resections and in cirrhotic patients for pain relief. Coming to acetaminophen, the half-life of acetaminophen is prolonged in patients with chronic liver disease. Normally people tend, some uh, centers tend not to use acetaminophen thinking that it causes liver toxicity but that is not true. In, even in liver disease, uh, there are enough stores of glutathione and CYP2E1, so this can be used safely. The only thing is that half-life of 
acetaminophen is prolonged. Coming to metabolism of acetaminophen or paracetamol, 90% undergoes glucosinidation and sulfation. This metabolism is not affected in liver disease. Only the metabolism which is affected in liver disease is the 5% of the metabolism. And even if this 5% is affected, it depends upon the glutathione stores. If there is enough glutathione stores, there is no hepatotoxic uh, elements after metabolism of paracetamol. When the glutathione stores are decreased, and if we give higher dose of paracetamol, that leads to generation of our NAPQI, or that is the hepatotoxic element. So this can lead to toxicity. So normal, normally uh, acetaminophen can be used in patients with chronic liver disease, and the dose being reduced to 2 to 3 gram per day. Normally in non serotics up to 4 gram per day can be given. So postoperatively, this is the most common analgesic used. We use it as 500 mg divided into uh, 6 thali or 4 daily doses. That is quite safe in our patients who undergo liver resections and cirrhotics even. Now coming to opioids. Opioids are the mainstay of pain management in postoperative patients. They are metabolized by the cytochrome P450 enzyme and results in multiple metabolites. There are numerous side effects of uh, opioids such as constipation, arrhythmias, dry mouth, myoclonus. They delay the uh, recovery of the gut uh, mo mobility, they cause rigidity, urinary retention. So from now there's a transition from opioid to opioid-free analgesia postoperatively to reduce the side effects of opioids. There are attempts to do away from the opioids and move to regional anesthesia so as to facilitate a better recovery postoperatively. Coming to various individual opioids that are used, the most common opioid being used is fentanyl. It is metabolized by the cytochrome P3A4 in the liver. It has less histamine release compared to other opioids, so it causes less hemodynamic disturbances. And in liver disease, there is no dose adjustment required, but in repeated dosing, it tends to accumulate in cirrhotic. So dose, uh, in repeated dosing, the dose may reduce by 25 to 30 percent. Morphine has been the most common gold standard drug for postoperative pain relief. But in liver disease, there is diminished first pass metabolism. There is a diminished metabolism in the liver that leads to accumulation of morphine and its metabolites in the body if it used in cirrhotic patients. So it is generally avoided in patients with cirrhosis and renal failure. If it has to be used, the dose and frequency has to be decreased by 50%, but generally it should be avoided due to prolonged duration of cirrhotics. Other common analgesics being tramadol. Tramadol has an unpredictable onset. It is variable in normal patients also. So in cirrhotics, it is further unpredictability is there. So it should be avoided, uh, avoided in cirrhotic patients. Tramadol precipitates seizures. So it should uh, be uh, used uh, wisely in patients who have uh, seizure disorders. Remifentanil. Remifentanil is a uh, ultra short acting opioid that is cleared by non specific plasma esterases. This is not metabolized by the liver and it is uh, metabolized by the uh, plasma esterases to inactive metabolites. So, no dose adjustment is needed and it does not accumulate in hepatic or renal toxicity and can be safely used intraoperatively and postoperatively. Now, coming to the IVPCA. IVPCA is the most common used pain modality uh, management uh, modality for postoperative patients. Advantage of this is uh, it, uh, that it is self-administered and a mechanical pump where the patient himself, when he feels pain, can administer dosage by pressing a button. So it gives patient autonomy, increases patient satisfaction, and the patient himself feels involved in uh, management of his pain and increases satisfaction and has shown to decrease pain scores. There's a safety mechanism in this that there's a lockout period that each dose can be given after 15 to 20 minutes so that to avoid overdosing. All drugs, all opioids can be used in this IVPCA like morphine, fentanyl, hydromorphine and oxycodone. The drugs commonly used for IVPCA are morphine, fentanyl. In varying dosage, they can be used according to the institutional protocol and the pain of the patients. For IVPCA in patients with liver disease, Morphine, as I told, is metabolized and conjugated by the liver. Hence, it should not be used. Otherwise, we need a gold standard for postoperative pain relief. The Im 
the impaired, impaired postoperative liver functions may result in accumulation of morphine and its side effects. Hence, fentanyl is used here and in all liver patients for pain management postoperatively. The side effects of opioids, as I told, are nausea, pruritus, vomiting, respiratory depression, constipation, and sedation. And further, these are increased if the patient is in liver disease. They in decrease the postoperative gut mobility, increase postoperative complications. Hence, there's been a trend to avoid use of postoperative opioids and shift over to regional anesthesia. Now, coming over to regional techniques. These regional techniques over the past 20 years have been gaining fame due to lesser reliance on opioids and better postoperative recovery. Regional techniques first is the central neuraxial blockade. This is divided into two classes, epidural analgesia and spinal analgesia. Spinal analgesia includes intrathecal morphine. Coming, uh, what is the difference between the epidural analgesia and spinal anesthesia? The epidural anesthesia includes the insertion of a needle into the epidural space that lies outside the dura. This is the spinal cord. This is the dura. This is the subarachnoid space where the CSF runs. This space is the epidural space where the epidural needle is put and the epidural catheter is inserted to give drugs. Here all the spinal nerves are there where, which can be blocked by giving local anesthetics and opioids. So here in this space the epidural needle is inserted and the epidural catheter is inserted. Deeper to this place, uh, space lies the subarachnoid space or where the CSF goes. Here we can deposit drugs to directly block the spinal nerves which are coming out from the spinal cord. So these two spaces are important for postoperative analgesia. Coming to the epidural anesthesia, this is the gold standard for open abdominal surgery. In addition to pain relief, it also mitigates the surgical stress response, decreases the neuroendocrine, sympathetic and pituitary response, decreases the metabolic response, prevents hyperglycemia and protein catabolism, and reduces pulmonary complications such as hypoxia, atelectasis, in uh, colorectal abdominal surgeries, all ERAS guidelines advocate the use of epidural anesthesia. Though there are certain side effects of epidural anesthesia, the hypotension and motor blockade also occurs due to blockade of sympathetic nerves along with the pain fibers. This may lead to increased uh, IV fluid administration and they may also lead to motor block which may impair the mobilization in the postoperative period but this can be adjusted by giving a lower dose of local anesthetics. Also, there's an increased risk of pruritus and urinary retention and some serious complications of epidural hematoma and abscess formation with epidural anesthesia. Now, different surgeries require insertion of epidural catheter at different levels. For upper abdominal surgeries and uh, liver surgeries, the insertion level of the epidural catheter should be at the mid-thoracic or lower thoracic level to provide an appropriate pain relief. Now the commonly used drugs in epidural analgesia are the local anesthetics like bupivacaine and ozopivacaine. In, they are used in concentrations where only they block the sensory fibers and not the motor fibers. Along with local anesthetics, uh, we can use opioids such as morphine and fentanyl to provide good adequate pain relief. Morphine is a gold standard drug used to provide analgesia uh, in post-operative patients. Morphine alone or with local anesthetics provides the most satisfactory pain relief in uh, post-operative patients. A single bolus dose of morphine of 2 to 4 mg is enough to provide analgesia for 24 to 48 hours post-operatively. There are various studies which compared the uh, in open liver resections in cirrhosis fired at all compared epidural analgesia with intravenous PCA. They found that pain scores were low, at rest were similar with epidural analgesia and IV PCA, but pain scores were lower with coughing. And the patients with IV PCA, they had more sedation. And patients with uh, epidural analgesia had lesser incidence of post-operative nausea and vomiting. Similar study was conducted uh, for liver dissection for living donation. They compared epidural analgesia with postoperative uh, opioid use, they found that epidural analgesia had lower VAS scores, pulmonary function tests were better protected, and they reduced atelectasis and had better pain control. Similar studies conducted by many centers have shown that the, even if the pain con scores are similar between IV PCA and epidural analgesia, they have been reduced 
post-operative uh, side effects with epidural analgesia used and a faster recovery. There are certain concerns regarding epidural analgesia. The main concern is post-operative coagulopathy and safety after epidural catheterization in liver resections. Liver resections lead to a derangement of post-operative liver functions and to the PTA and INR. So the indwelling epidural catheter has a risk of epidural hematoma. And they also have risk of hypotension associated with epidural analgesia that leads to increased uh, perioperative fluid administration. But this hypotension is a good sign, a good thing in uh, uh, liver surgeries because there is a need to maintain lower CVP to prevent uh, bleeding. So this helps us to maintain a lower CVP to prevent excessive blood loss. Now a post-op uh, study was done in ILBS to study the post-operative uh, coagulation profile in liver donor hepatectomy. 50 patients were considered and TEG and conventional coagulation tests were done. The study found that although the conventional coagulation tests showed hypocoagulability, the TEG didn't show any hypocoagulability features post-operatively. There were, in fact, there was hypercoagulability on TEG. So there's never been a problem of catheter removal and any uh, post-operative epidural hematoma concerns. Now coming to the next uh, central neuraxial modality, this is, this is intrathecal morphine. Intrathecal morphine is giving morphine via spinal needle. This is simpler and quicker alternative, lesser technical failure, less chance of infection. A single shot of 200 to 500 microgram morphine is given that is effective for 16 to 24 hours. Uh, various studies have compared the use of intrathecal morphine with IVPCA. These uh, studies have shown that there is the lower pain scores on postoperative day one with intrathecal morphine than with IVPCA and there were no other side effects. Similarly, many studies have compared that they have found that intrathecal morphine also reduces the pain scores on postoperative day one. But the only drawback with intrathecal morphine is the duration of action is only 24 hours and the top-up can't be given. So from the second post-operative day, again, IVPCA has to be used. Now coming to the plain blocks, plain blocks or field blocks are certain blocks which uh, block the abdominal nerve plexuses and uh, prevent pain in certain dermatomes. The commonly used plain blocks are transverse abdominus plain block or tab block, transversus, transversalis fascia block, quadratus lumbarum block, and lectus sheath block. These are used as an adjuvant for analgesia intraoperatively and postoperatively. Tab block uh, involves the deposition of local anesthetics between the uh, internal oblique and transversus abdominal muscle in the transversus abdominal plane plexus. This plexus supplies the T7 to L1 from T7 uh, to L1 nerves. So blocking this plexus can prevent transmission of plane. A block is given postoperatively and a catheter is put to infuse local anesthetics which can give pain relief. Similar is a quadratus lumborum block which uh, the quadratus lumborum muscle around them, there is a nerve plexus which supplies from the T7 to L1 uh, nerves. So blocking this area gives us a pain relief around the T7 to L1 nerves. Here again a catheter can be put and postoperative pain relief can be given using the catheter. Similar, a new block from has been developed, started being used, is the erector spinae block. Here, uh, using an ultrasound, we can block the erector spinae nerve plexus that is present around the transverse process of the ribs. And uh, this provides an adequate analgesia for surgeries intraoperatively and postoperatively. Rectus sheath block can be used for umbilical hernias, uh, in, this is a good block to provide even anesthesia for sick patients of liver disease who come for emergency umbilical hernia surgery. We can do away with the GA and use a rectus sheath block to give anesthesia and postoperative analgesia as well. There have been many studies which uh, compared the use of uh, field blocks. All these field blocks are not a modality of analgesia on their own. They only supplement the analgesia. So whenever we use these field blocks, there has been seen that there has been lower use of opioids, but they cannot do away with the use of opioids. They just supplement our uh, opioids and reduce the opioid dose. Now coming to the last modality, these are the wound catheters. These are inserted at time of closure, surgical closure, and inserted into the subcutaneous plane or the deep 
uh, intramuscular pain, either the rectus, intra oblique, or transverse abdominis, and they are mostly limited for hepatobiliary and pancreatic surgery. They have the advantages that they are patient friendly. There is no serious side effects like epidural hematoma and abscess. They show comparable pain relief, and there is less chance of perioperative hypotension, and they have least side effects, no side effects of opioids, and no side effects of epidurals. So, so there have been many studies which had the use of wound insertion catheters and TEA, uh, epidural analgesia. They found that there was no difference in pain scores and the opioid consumption was decreased in wound insertion, wound infusions as compared to the epidural analgesia and patients had lesser post-operative complications. Similar studies showed uh, such results. So uh, the guidelines for uh, a prospect uh, recommendations were given in 2020 for uh, specific uh, post-operative pain management following liver sections. They advocate the perioperative and intraoperative use of acetaminophen, NSAIDs, thoracic epidural analgesia, uh, subcostal transversal abdominal plane blocks. Postoperatively, they advocate the use of NSAIDs and acetaminophenes and catheter-based regional anesthesia techniques like uh, wound infiltration catheters and plain blocks. So uh, there are certain indications, uh, certain uh, interventions which are there but are not routinely followed due to lack of procedure specific evidence but cert certain conditions they can be used to provide analgesia like ketamine, IV lignocaine, dexamethasone, dexmedetomidine and magnesium sulfate but they have limited evidence in liver patients so they are not used commonly in liver patients. ILBS protocol, preoperative uh, counseling of the patient is done. Intraoperatively, an epidural catheter is sited into the thoracic space. Uh, IV fentanyl bolus of 2 microgram per kg is given uh, prior to induction, followed by 25 to 50 microgram SOS whenever the treating physician feels there is a need of intraoperative analgesia. Then in the epidural space, a morphine bolus of 2 to 3 milligram is given followed by levobupivacaine, uh, 0.125 mg at 6 to 8 ml per hour. And then uh, postoperatively, uh, 500 mg paracetamol is used, which is given 6 hourly. Postoperatively, uh, epidural infusion is continued up to 72 hours with uh, levobupivacaine at 6 to 8 ml per hour. If the patient still has pain and the VAS score is more than 3, a IV PCA is con uh, added with fentanyl and a paracetamol is Added. Paracetamol always continues six hourly. If there's after the epidural, if there is VAS more than four or visual analog sc scale of pain is more than four, IV PCA started. The dosage is started with 0.2 into weight that gives the single bolus dose. A lockout is there of 15 minutes and four doses uh, are given in an hourly. And then the patient is reassessed. If the pain score is still increasing, we can increase the IV PCA dose by 10 microgram per dose. We can give add regional blocks to it. We can add a long-acting epidural morphine. And we can give a basal infusion of fentanyl if we, even if after all this our patient's pain doesn't improve. If the patient's pain is decreasing or is remaining the same, then the uh, do same dose is continued and over a few days it is converted to oral drugs. The ongoing studies in the department are comparison of intrathecal analgesia uh, with morphine and epidural morphine for donor hepatectomy and comparison between lumbar and thoracic uh, epidural anesthesia for donor hepatectomy. Thank you.